My name is Greg Bishop, for people who aren't uh, familiar with me. Um, UIS grad student, working on my master's in communication. Something I'm going to be presenting tonight, uh, at least elements of it, concepts from it, um, give you a little bit of a basis about where I'm coming from, uh, and what I'm going to be analyzing and, and researching. Uh, and of course it has a lot to do with the Occupy Wall Street movement. And in particular that first month of Occupy Wall Street, from September 17th to October uh, 15th, when, what, some 700 people were arrested in New York on a bridge. Uh, so the, that's the, the frame of which I'm looking at, or at least the time frame. But seriously, guys, thank you so much for showing up. Um, it's a Friday night. It's beautiful outside. You could be uh, somewhere else, uh, but you chose to spend some time with me tonight. So yeah, I mean, you're more than welcome to go and start painting or whatever, uh, you know, household chores, sporting events, backyard barbecues, but you guys decided to, uh, to join me here tonight uh, so, you, so you, I could share with you my research, my, uh, my concepts and ideas that I've been working with for um, months upon months. So again, I really do appreciate everybody being here on a, on a Friday night. Now I'm going to present ideas, concepts uh, for my thesis, but I also want to open it up for discussion. I think the people we have here, we're going to have a pretty good discussion uh, to be able to uh, delve into the topic a little bit, a little bit deeper. Um, now, with the study of communication, there's a lot of discussion about the making of meaning. All right, I'm in communication. Uh, that's that's what I've got my undergrad in. Uh, it's also what I'm getting my master's in as well. So. Uh, communication brings in all kinds of different elements, uh, biological things, also uh, you know, political and, and sociological and psycho uh, psychological, uh, it brings it all together. Uh, so the, um, the communication discipline, it's uh, very interdisciplinary, all right? but it's also fascinating when you start getting into media effects, and that's something we're going to be discussing tonight. A uh, bunch of different channels out there. Uh, and I'm not just talking about your TV channels, I'm talking about face-to-face -face communication, cell phone to social uh, network to cell phone type of communication. These are all different channels uh, that there are available for us to communicate with each other. Um, and, and there's also a couple of different big areas. You've got interpersonal communication, which is more face-to-face, -face, the relationships you have uh, with work, with class, with lovers, and so on. Uh, then there's the mass communication side of it. That's what I'm more interested in right now, uh, the mass communication aspect. However, with some of these different forms of media, you're going to have some crossover. You're going to have interpersonal communication intermingling with mass communication. And that's really the case with social networks. Uh, with Facebook and Twitter, you're communicating um, in an inter interpersonal manner, but you're doing it through a mass communication means. So we're going to be focusing on mass media. And if you guys could throw out some ideas, what, what's mass media? Newspapers, magazines, television, radio, television, radio, I mean, things that reach a large number of people. All right, so that's what we're going to be uh, focusing on with uh, our, our analysis of the Occupy movement for that first month. So. Uh, so many different studies uh, and critiques about media coverage uh, of various protest movements uh, with some fascinating results, really, uh, how the mainstream media covers a particular uh, protest movement, how they frame it, uh, the, the types of words they use, um, the types of contexts they wrap their stories around. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of these things, uh, but also Analyzing the mainstream media helps us understand the agenda setting function of the media. Something else we'll discuss a little bit. Uh, in particular, my study, I'm working to identify, discover, and critically determine the quality of different media frames used by both the mainstream media and the alternative media. So we're looking again at the first month of Occupy, September 17th. I remember it clearly. I was on the radio at the time. And I, I saw the buzz that morning. They're going to be doing some Occupy demonstration. I had no idea what it was. And I was on the air watching the live stream event from downtown Manhattan on Wall Street. 
real time, people talking to the camera, walking around some disembodied cameraman, interviewing people on the street. It had no structure. It had no um, no coherent timeline. It was just kind of a, a big cluster of people walking around. You could tell it was buzzing all over the place. Uh, so I remember it clearly when it started, uh, and, and I, I went ahead and put together a media diary. It's an incomplete media diary, but every day I'd go out and find articles from the mainstream media, and I'd find articles from the alternative media, just so I can keep track of them. Since then, I've gone back, and some of them take it down. So it's almost like I have to do the media diary again. So uh, fascinating how the internet is a great resource, but then again, things can switch on you without any, um, without any word, because you know they don't have to notify you of anything, which is, which is fine. But we're going to be looking again um, at protest movements and how they're framed. Uh, but let's go through a little bit of a history of, of, of protest movements. Uh, we could look back just a few years ago to the Battle of Seattle, where they had, I believe it was the, uh, the G8, all right, 1998, 99? WTO. Oh, the WTO, OK, thank you. Yes, so the Battle of Seattle, um, the way the media covered that, uh, you can almost isolate that whole instance and, and get a lot of study out of it. We can even go back to the 80s with uh, labor movements and the protests there. Or in the 70s and the 60s, you've got the anti-war movement that overshadowed the civil rights movement. Now, we could go back and grab all of these different artifacts, different media artifacts, and even way back to the suffragist movement for the women's rights movement. We could look at the handbills and the uh, 19th century newspaper editorials to see how they framed the uh, women's rights movements back then so they could have the right to vote. We could even go back and look at uh, you know, political cartoons that depicted uh, how, uh, how it framed uh, the, the Underground Railroad, for instance. Okay? But to help us out, especially with the lack of resource and the lack of time, uh, we're going to analyze a more recent phenomenon, and that's the the Occupy Movement. Uh, and a lot of the discussion later is going to be just that. We're going to be openly discussing some of your observations. But first, I want to set a nice, solid uh, foundation for how we're going to discuss these various things. So on to um, what we're going to be looking at, the, the review, our literature review here. We need to understand the current media landscape. We need to understand what framing is uh, and, and how all these things fit together when it comes to protest movements. <coughs> and also, we're going to be discussing the upcoming G8 in a way. So we know we've got a good foundation, review Occupy, but then moving forward, you've got uh, the NATO summit, rather, in Chicago. How is the media going to portray that? We'll, we'll discuss that a little bit as well. But let's face it, if the media is not reporting on a movement, the movement's going to have a difficult time to win approval from the public. And that's uh, who make the decisions. We like to think the public makes the decisions, but other people disagree. One person that disagrees is Edward Bernays. He wrote a book, 1923, called Propaganda. It's a fascinating read. If you ever get your hands on it, I believe it's free to read online. Uh, it, it details. Uh, just how precise public relations and media can be. Uh, here's a, a couple of uh, clips from his book. He says, The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We're governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we've never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. This is 1923. All right? Edward Bernays is the father of public relations. 1923. We're, we're in 2012 right now. Think about all the conferences that sales reps go to. Think of all the uh, you know, associations that there are popping up around uh, how to sell motor oil or how to, uh, you know, best get sales references for a particular type of plastic or a pill or 
uh, a charitable organization. You know, they, they have these various workshops, and they've only gotten more fine tuned since 1923. Okay. So it's pretty remarkable to, to read through some of his uh, uh, writings and, and realize just how long ago that was and how much it's evolved since then. Um, my examination of how the media frames Occupy, in a way, kind of goes with uh, the spirit of what Bernays is trying to draw out in propaganda. Because he says, uh, we need to explain the structure of mechanisms which control the public mind and to tell how it is manipulated by the special pleader who seeks to create public acceptance for a particular idea or commodity. Public acceptance, public opinion, these things are very important. Agenda setting, priming, these are two big mechanisms that have been analyzed by communication and political studies scholars. Agenda setting is the process for which things are made important. What's, what's salient in the news? What's the headline? What's above the fold? What does a news editor, a gatekeeper, what do they think the public needs to know and is the most important thing? That's kind of along the lines of what agenda setting is. But agenda setting also works in uh, the public setting the agenda and also the policymakers setting the agenda. So you've got this triangle, the media, the public, policymakers. They all kind of feed off of each other. All right? Um, so, any particular issue could be drummed up by the media, the public reacts, then forcing the policymakers to do something about it. Or it could be flipped around completely. Policymakers do something about it, the public reacts, then the media covers the story. All right, so it's a weird triangle, and that's pretty much the agenda setting theory. Priming is an interesting um, issue, one that I, I want to get more into in future research. Uh, and, and to give you an idea of what priming is, uh, I've heard a couple examples in the past week that seem to be priming the public for a particular type of event or uh, to frame a certain issue. Uh, one story I heard, uh, it was just a brief mention about uh, the next big bubble that's going to burst. And I saw this probably about a year ago where um, student loan debt with the economy the way it is, that's going to blow up. Uh, because we're going to have so many people graduating with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, and <laughs> some people aren't going to be able to find employment. How are you going to pay off your student loan if you don't have employment? Therefore, a bubble's about to burst. Now, ABC News and the Associated Press this week have been putting out kind of facts and figures in a way, not saying that there is a crisis, but almost priming the public for the potential of a crisis. The story goes, more Americans have student loan debt than they have credit card and automobile debt combined, which means it could cause a crisis in the long run. So in a way, the, the media is priming the public, getting them ready. Something else I heard also was, uh, you know, more people are moving into urban areas rather than living in rural areas. In a way, it's kind of just, it's, it's, it's putting a concept out there, an idea out there, for the public to react in a certain way. So that, that's priming. Something else I really want to get into more in a future study. But right now, a big mechanism for forming public opinion is framing. One thing we can uh, take away from Bernays' writings is that our tastes, behaviors, our heuristic abilities, our desires, etc., these things are formed and molded by the decision makers. Now, I'm curious, and we can take a moment here to talk a little bit about your, your feelings about that, that we as consumers, our tastes are formulated by somebody in, in, in you know, downtown Manhattan at a PR firm. Now, everybody's got different tastes. Everybody is influenced by different things. But what are your thoughts about that? I mean, it is psychology in a way, but yet... I mean, now that you know, you, it's, it's there, what are your thoughts? How do you feel about that? Well, uh, geographically, we're becoming more of a monoculture. And you were saying that we're becoming more urbanized now. That's been happening for, what, a century, mm -hmm. um, uh, planetary-wise. Planetary so geographically, we're becoming a monoculture, which makes it easier 
to commodify us as a monoculture. Um, so the more we get kind of squeezed in, the more easy it is to... Well, um, instead of being in the public commons mm -hmm. in various regional areas in our, in our coffee houses, in our little town squares, in our little regional areas, getting our regional news, or getting more of this mono news. Um, Adbusters 2000 um, came up with a, a book, Culture Jamming, on the commodification, where, you know, in every generation now it's more and more and more. Your Twitter feeds, your video. I love Culture Jamming. I, I love it. There's something about it when it's, it's creating a spectacle, in a way. You know, it's, it's creating that society of the, of the spectacle that Guy Debord talked about and how people just all of a sudden, like like a flash dance. You know, if you witness a flash dance out of nowhere, you're like, huh, you're taken back by it. And you're, you're, you're compelled to find out what happened. Why did uh, 20,000 people all of a sudden do Thriller in front of me? Uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, that type of thing, it's, it's fascinating. But I, I, I like what you said where the more um, grouped we get, the more easy it is to control the media message. And the, 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 the greater it is that it's going to be watered down. Uh, and they're not going to be telling us what exactly we need to know, uh, especially on a regional level, which, which is important. So um, it's pretty staggering just to think about that, that our decisions, our desires, molded by uh, the decision makers somewhere in you know, downtown Manhattan. Now, back in the time that uh, Bernays' book, Propaganda, was written, he says, Whatever of social importance is done today, whether it's politics, finance, manufacture, agriculture, charity, education, or other fields, it must be done with the help of propaganda. Propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. Now, he, uh, of course, tried to give propaganda a different connotation. He even said at the beginning of his book that propaganda... Um, is a bad word, has been labeled a bad word, but he's trying to, in his writings, to um, cast a different light on it. And I don't, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with Bernays' writings, actually, to be honest. I more disagree with what he has to say, more because of the manipulation side of it and how systematically he lays it out, because it is a science, uh, and it's quite astonishing. Um, but he's trying to change the connotation of, of propaganda from a negative to a positive. And he says, anyone with sufficient influence can lead sections of the public, at least for a time and for a given purpose. Formerly, the rulers, they were the leaders. They laid out the course of history just simply by doing what they wanted. Nowadays, their successors have to get uh, public's approval. And to do that, uh, to get the public's approval for what they want done, for what the decision makers want done, be it have sympathy for a certain cause, to buy a certain product, to act a certain way when you're told to produce an ID. You know, the decision makers um, have to get public consent to do that. So there are very um, distinct ways that they do do that. And through framing in the media, it's one way that they, uh, they accomplish their, their mission. Uh, in certain cases, we can affect some changes. This is coming from uh, Bernays again. Uh, in certain cases, we can affect some changes in public opinion with a fair degree of accuracy by operating a certain mechanism, just as the motorist can regulate the speed of his car by manipulating the flow of gasoline. All right, Edward Bernays, 1923. Keep in mind. Um, so they can public relations masters, people who have. Uh, fine-tuned their ability to sway public opinion through public relations, um, they can trigger a certain emotion or a certain reaction just by changing a couple of words. And here's an example. Minor changes in wording impact people's support of policy choices. A study found that people would prefer a program where 200 out of 600 people might be saved as opposed to one in which there is a one-third probability that all 600 will live, but two-thirds probability that no one will be saved, even though the prospects for lives saved were both mathematically identical. 
So you've got one way of presenting it. This program is going to save 200 out of 600 people. If you present it that way, people are more accepting of it, of the program. If you present it in more of a convoluted way with one-third probability and, you know, 600 people or, you know, if you just water it or make it more confusing, then you might not have as many people turned on to it. It might be more difficult to get them to go along. Well, I was just going to say that people might have been more drawn to the first one because it says with some certainty that some lives will be saved. And uh, it's more appealing. Yeah. It's easier to grasp. Yeah. But essentially, 200 out of 600 people might be saved versus there's a one-third probability that all 600 will live, but a two-thirds probability that no one will be saved. That's an abstraction, whereas the other one's more concrete. Sure. But different equations, same sum. But it's how it's presented and how people react to it. And, th and these are the types of things where it's so systematic, it's so scientific, they... They have it down to a science. Bernays continues, he says, by playing upon an old cliche or manipulating a new one, the propagandist can sometimes swing a whole mass of group emotions. Now these old cliches, they're schemes. Uh, so we have the frame and then we have the scheme that, 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 that it plays upon us. Um, and we have it developed inside of us through years of being triggered by different media messages. Um, so now we're going to get into framing. One man who um, pioneered the way for framing research was uh, Robert Entman. He wrote this in 1993, to frame is to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient in a communication text in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, casual interpretation, moral evaluation, and or treatment recommendations. So again, that's simply devising a way to provoke a certain response simply by having a story. By having a story in the newspaper or a packaged TV news report that airs on channel 20 at 6.30. Um, to form public opinion, a producer of media must use a certain selection of words or terms to invoke a particular response. Some argue, like Bernays, that there's that invisible government. Now, there are things to think about, like what's on the agenda, particular items to think about, but there's also a second level beyond that. So you've got the first level, the thing to think about, and then the second level is how to think about that. And that second level is where framing comes in. First level, where the thing to think about that's more of agenda setting. But framing is when you get into how to think about that thing. All right, so are you thinking positively about it or are you thinking you know, uh, disparagingly about it? Uh, the, the framing theory, it's so scattershot. It's, it's so fresh and new, just a couple of decades of, of theorizing about frames. Uh, it's hard to pin down exactly what's the what's the go-to framing um, model. And there are so many different ways to go about it. That's a good thing and it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing because it allows us to, um, to find the latent frames, the frames that are undiscovered. And each situation is going to provide a different way to frame it. Each story, each individual, each event, there are going to be multiple ways to frame it, some of which probably haven't been discovered yet, uh, consciously or unconsciously. Um, now, in my opinion, it's, spl it's splintered a little bit, but um, there's a, a lot of great research out there. But for the purposes of viewing the media frames, we're only going to view the media frames. We're not going to view, at least for my research, we're not going to um, look at uh, how the, the public frames a particular issue. So we're only looking at the, what the media creates, not what the public creates, or how they take in that information. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I don't have the resources to go out and you know, try to entice you guys to keep a media diary, to uh, you know, have a 30, 45 minute interview with me every other week to talk about your thoughts about this media and go, go over the examples with you and code every little, yeah, I, just, I don't have the, the time for that. 
uh, or the resources. Maybe in a future study, possibly. But right now, we're just looking at the media frames, not the, the user frames, not the consumer frame. Framing is all about providing context. Think about a window frame. You look at the window frame. You've got the curtains, you've got the stained glass, you've got a little decal of a hummingbird, whatever it is. There are things in that frame that are going to change your perception of what's through that frame. So in a way, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good metaphor for it. But everyone frames something when they convey information to a person. So framing's not a bad thing, it's just a way to provide context. So when you talk with somebody, you're providing context to them. Um, and the media, when they report on something, they have to provide context or else it's just going to be raw data, which if you're not trained a certain way, that raw data, you're not going to absorb it. You're not going to understand what that raw data means. Now the frame is uh, important because it helps in the making of uh, meaning, in the meaning making process and understanding particular issues, events, uh, persons or stories. Since we're focused only on media frames, we're going to rely on the researcher's critical interpretation to determine what the frames are and how they're being used. Uh, and in my case, for my thesis, I'm the researcher, so it has to be clear in my research uh, that I'm using a critical lens to go through all of these. It's going to be qualitative, it's not going to be quantitative. I'm not uh, going through and adding up numbers and, like I mentioned, having interviews with everybody, it's going to be more uh, just, just qualitative on my part uh, and critical analysis too. The reason framing is important is when a supranational organization wants an audience to develop sympathies towards a particular cause or a person or event through a context that will benefit them, they'll create a media message, even though, even through news stories. they'll. Yeah, a pharmacy, or not a pharmacy, but a, a big uh, drug maker will put out a news package for local affiliates of ABC that says this new study, it, it'll provide the script, it'll provide the B-roll, it'll even provide the voiceover. All generic so that the local ABC affiliate can have their talking head read the script, provide the B-roll with whatever voiceover, this is Brian Jones reporting. And it's essentially a propaganda piece from the drug maker sent out to all of these various TV stations. So framing plays a great role in that. And it can give, uh, it can give that particular company uh, quite the advantage in, in forming public opinion. Now there's this... Uh, Fantastic story, it's almost like folklore, about uh, John D. Rockefeller. And he is uh, the Standard Oil tycoon. Um, and I can't, I can't recall if it was Edward Bernays, the father of PR, or Ivy Lee, who was nicknamed Poison Ivy, um, also a, a PR, you know, the father of PR. He, uh, it was one of the two that was asked to help change John D. Rockefeller's image. And to change John D. Rockefeller's image in, in his, his later years, they hired a photographer to go around and take pictures of John D. Rockefeller handing out dimes and nickels to kids on the street. So when people would see these pictures of Standard Oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller handing out change to kids, you know, that changed the public's perception quite a bit about John D. Rockefeller. He wasn't any more this this monopoly type of ty uh, tycoon. He was a gracious man who handed money to kids. Mm -hmm. That cost him ten cents. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it was. It, it's a. It's a. That in a way was one of the big foundations in the in the, the, the paradox shift of public relations. It, 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 it's like I said, it's folklore, and it really happened. But it's a. It's a perfect example of just how uh, this stuff works. Now we're all selfish. Admit it, we have our own interests in mind. When you tell a story to somebody about your first fishing trip or the first time you rode a bicycle, you're not going to share all the bad things that happened and how you screwed up. You're going to frame it in a way, you're going to provide a certain context 
so that you come out as the, the, the hero of some kind. That you rode your bike with no training wheels, which by the way, my first time I rode a bike with no training wheels. Or that you caught the big bass uh, the first time you went fishing. So you're going you're gonna to frame things in a certain way um, to make yourself look better. And in a way, that's what these huge mega corporations are doing with a significant amount of their dollars. They're working and devising ways to shape a message that best suits them. And you might be asking, how, how's, what does this have to do with Occupy? We'll, we'll get to that in an open discussion, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork here for how we're going to be talking about it. Framing the various types of media, uh, the alternative media, the mainstream media, we'll, we'll get to all of that. So, um, so since we're focused only on media frames, we're going to um, take a look at various uh, framing elements. I've got to find my position here. So the news frame and the news media, they stress certain aspects of issues. Back to you, know, you telling only certain things, the good things about your fishing trip or you riding your bike. Uh, and they'll de-emphasize others. So by de-emphasizing that the toxins in the oil leaked out in Chile are poisoning the plants, you know, if they don't tell you that, they're de-emphasizing that. And you're not knowing about it. Instead, you just hear a settlement was paid to some indigenous people. You don't hear the, the, the back story about how detrimental that oil spill is. You're just hearing about the settlement, that's it. So they, they'll tell you certain things, but they will not tell you the damning things. So for the effect to take place, the media frame needs to activate pre-existing mental nodes or pre-existing frames through which the person receiving the message might think about the world, such as risk and gain, and such pre-existing frames. They're called uh, schemes, the media frames. They make certain schemes more accessible to the receiver, which means the way the story is told becomes the way in which the individual thinks about the issue discussed. Again, providing context. How's that story told? What kind of frame is it providing? Um, that really leads to how you as the media user, not necessarily the, community, the, the consumer, the user, um, how you are uh, interpreting that. So the question is, who benefits from a certain type of frame with the coverage of Occupy? whose interests are supported by the mainstream media, and whose interests are supported by the alternative media, something I hope to define more with my research. Now, we could then evaluate which type of media framing we'll use. When a news event occurs, a journalist, at least from my practice with the, the radio station writing news stories, you've got to get the most important information out there first. All right, you'll notice that in hard news stories from the elite press, and by the elite press, I mean you know, the New York Times, the uh, Wall Street Journal, these types of uh, newspapers that have the inside scoops all the time, always, uh, because they're so close to the elite. That's why they're called the elite press, because they have very close connections with elite lawmakers and uh, other people of prominent, uh, uh, prominent power. So uh, with Occupy, um, we have to ask that question, whose interests are being supported by the alternative and the mainstream? So we could evaluate the different types that are used with the, with the journalists and how they write stories. The lead's going to be information, the most important thing, the most salient thing. But then, as you get further into the story, you're going to see more context pop out. And with framing, it's one of those things where you might not notice it right off the bat, once you research more into what framing is, then you start seeing it. It's like it just starts popping up all over the place. You watch a, a, a television program and you see all these different frames uh, coming at you. And hopefully, you know, after tonight, you're able to better discern what's going on there and how the frames are being applied to you as you're consuming that media. So how does this work? You get a certain scheme and uh, a frame that triggers that scheme. So there are various triggers used within framing. For instance, a skeptical trigger. Say you're watching a story and it has 
even the slightest tint of skepticism in the report. You're going to be skeptical while watching that report, and you're going to be skeptical about whatever the news story was skeptical about. So in a way, it's providing the frame, and it acts with a certain scheme that you have developed inside of you. So once the skeptical scheme has been activated, future initiatives are also regarded as being skeptical. So it depends on how the frame is and how fresh it is in the person's mind, and repetition does work. A couple of different uh, examples of framing. There's value framing, uh, which is providing salience for different uh, values, how words are used. Does it uh, frame it in a favorable light or in a negative light? And one way, one example is uh, abortion. And is it pro-life? Is it anti-abortion? Or is it pro-choice or pro-abortion? You know, these, which, which term do you hear? You don't hear pro-abortion. You hear pro-choice. You don't hear anti-abortion. You hear pro-life. So in a way, just providing that type of change in terminology you're, you're putting something in a more positive light. And that's essentially where we're, where we're headed with that, with the value framing. You're placing certain things in a more favorable light just simply by the words you're using to describe it. On the flip side, you can also make things more negative simply by describing it in a certain way. There's the responsibility framing. This has a lot to do with um, episodic framing, or with thematic framing. And one is more focused on the individual, like human-centered pieces, the, the, the stories you get uh, about the kid who wins the spelling bee, but really the stories about the, uh, the spelling curriculum at school. But the way it's centered around the kid, it's more, it's more acceptable. People are able to understand better what the story is trying to promote. Um, then you've got the thematic frame, which tries to um, provide, in a way, an understanding about a problem, uh, which leads to a culprit of some kind. The strategy and issue framing, um, this, this type of framing, stories focus only on uh, the strategy of a movement, the strategy of a candidate, the strategy of a company, um, or an issue story will focus on one particular issue, not an event, not a person, um, just on the issue. So there's a bunch of sub-frames that I, um, I felt I could, I could draw out of researching Occupy. So we've got the frames, we've also got some sub-frames. And keep in mind earlier, framing is so splintered, it's hard to pin down a true and, and pure framing theory, just because there's so much research, there's so many different uh, scholars that are, are jumping into the issue of framing. So with that, we can find some frames that aren't so apparent. And with the Occupy movement, I, I feel I've, I've found just a few, and I might find more as my research continues. Uh, some of those frames are the, the, the violence frame. That's pretty apparent. Um, you might see news stories where it's all about the violence that broke out. Absolutely nothing to do with the Occupy movement and their grievances, the story is just about the violence that broke out. You've also got the size frame. The size frame is talking about how the organizers expected thousands of people, but only a dozen showed up. And in a way, by reporting that, it, it lessens the legitimacy of whatever movement's there. You've also got um, the culprit frame, the sympathetic frame, which a lot of the alternative media has a sympathetic frame when reporting on various protest movements, because Lord knows the mainstream media does not have a sympathetic frame for protest movements. You've also got what I've deemed the hippie frame, and the hippie frame is the mainstream media in a way and I, there was one clip I saw of uh, some CNN anchors going back and forth, joking, laughing, while reporting about the Occupy movement. And this was in the first, the first month, uh, probably like week two or three. And they were just sitting there laughing, talking about how uh, you know, they were banging their drums and they had their 
tie-dye shirts on. It was just, it was very uh, disconcerting that this legitimate news organization was framing uh, this gathering of people who had true grievances. They were framing them as a, as a joke, as, you know, they were just a bunch of hippies there to, to bang on drums. And they would only show certain images that supported their framing of the deal. So the consumer, the user, they're watching, they think, huh, that's just a bunch of hippies down there. They have no true concerns. They're just, they don't have jobs. They're, they're hanging out in Zuccotti Park, all right? So that's, that's one frame that I feel that I was able to, uh, to define. And uh, with, my, with my thesis, I hope to break that down even more and to, uh, uh, to legitimize my, my frame discovery. Uh, understanding the media landscape very important. We've been tossing around the terms alternative media, mainstream media, new media, social media, all of these things, but we need to understand what each are. We do have mass media, which um, alternative media and mainstream media do fit into. Uh, you've got Democracy Now!, which is a, an alternative media outlet, but it is a mass media. It's syndicated, they're online, they're on the TV, uh, across the country, and around the world. But yet, they're considered an alternative media. Current TV. Current TV. Uh, I'm not too familiar with current TV. Is that online only, or do they have a cable channel? I'm not sure. That's Al Gore's thing, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you know, he's on the, uh, the cable system, too. Um, so, yeah, Olbermann just got fired from that, right? Okay. Um, And that could be considered an alternative media. I'm not sure if I would define it as an alternative media, but maybe when we get into some of the uh, definitions of alternative media, maybe it'll it'll stick out as a true alternative media, depending on what kind of uh, um, what kind of uh, groups that it supports. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a moment. But understanding the media landscape is very important. Um, the media are not just social systems. This is coming from I believe Habermas. Uh, so he says media are not just social systems; they're social systems that react, that reach a wide pub, uh, uh, public, and therefore part of a communication process within the public sphere. Of course, Habermas is the father of the public sphere, uh, so he talks a lot about the media's role in that, and and trying to uh, formulate and, and and facilitate communication. So for Habermas, uh, the public sphere is an ideal type of realm that's accessible to all citizens so they can control and limit state power through discussion, criticism, control, and elections, which elections are essentially the formulation of public opinion, which we talked a lot with Bernays. In the struggle of enlightenment, and again, the monarchy, the bourgeois public sphere, based on constitutional rights and the media, would emerge. Throughout its development, However, it would be deformed and controlled by special interests that constitute a climate of non-public opinion. And that is manipulated by commercial media and advertising. Habermas goes into quite a bit the commercialization of news and how that's lessening the news product, but it's not apparent. We accept that CNN runs 20 minutes worth of commercials, or that the local radio station runs 20 minutes worth of commercials, and we almost don't even realize it, because there's so much content, they break up the 20 minutes, you got two minutes here, you got three minutes there, essentially it all adds up, but it, it's the commercialization of the public sphere, something that Habermas talked about quite a bit. There's also other researchers out there who... Um, break down uh, what Habermas talks about and uh, one communication um, researcher says that Habermas imagines a true public sphere in which all competing groups and parties make information accessible to the public, engage the public in discussion to make political compromises and to legitimize each other through the process of public communication. That's the ideal, but I don't think we live in that ideal uh, public sphere because of the, uh, the uh, commercialization of the news. Um, spend a 
bit on this Habermas. I'm not familiar with that. Jürgen Habermas. Um, Sociologist? He's a German philosopher. Yeah, he's a philosopher. Okay. Uh, he's got some pretty profound stuff. Um, what does he do? He's still Recent, alive. yeah, recent. Okay. Uh, the book that I'm drawing from is The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. He has another book called Legitimation Crisis, which is fantastic, and that talks about that talks about how governments fall apart because they have trouble legitimizing themselves to the public. Because if a government oversteps its bounds, once might be forgivable, 900 times where a million people are killed. The public just doesn't accept it. The public doesn't accept it, therefore the power is gone. Um, so it's, the, those, are, those are two fantastic books. Uh, Legitimation Crisis. And the reason I'm using Habermas uh, with the public sphere, because he, he does talk about the public sphere a lot, simply because the media's involvement in the public sphere. So, you know, he talks about the commercialization of the media and the news uh, and how that uh, taints the public sphere, so... And he coined the term public sphere. Yeah, he did, he did coin the, the, the term public sphere. So Habermas, a great, uh, great source that I'll be using quite a bit in my thesis. Um, I'm going to start uh, trying to talk about news media only, not all the different types of media. So when we get to the conversation of mainstream media, you're going to see just how expansive the big five are, the, the, the media cartel, the mainstream media cartel, as, as one person calls it. And we're going to be doing a Marxist critique of the media uh, and of the mainstream media. Now, I'm not a Marxist, but yet Marxist critique is very useful. And in one particular area, criticizing ownership. Uh, the Marxist critique does that very well. Uh, so it allows for you know, in-depth analysis of ownership, of agency, um, uh, and also of uh, alienation, and those types of things. So uh, I will be using a Marxist critique to look at the Big Five for my thesis. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the media. Uh, we've got the news media, and the distinction is very important. News media does not mean media in all its varieties. Media can be music that's recorded and published under a certain label, or maybe even a sitcom that's produced by a particular studio that just so happens to be owned by the same company that put out the before-mentioned record, or a slew of cable channels offered up in all kinds of different tastes for different styles and cultures, all as a conduit for advertisers. Um, and with the media, the mainstream media in particular, because keep in mind, we've got Mass media, which can incorporate the mainstream media, and also the alternative media, and the new media, even. Then you've got the mainstream media, which are the big corporate mega giant media that own everything from film distributors to cable channels to uh, record companies um, to news networks. And then you've got alternative media, the likes of Democracy Now!, the likes of... Uh, What's the uh, Adbusters? That's an uh, alternative media. And even localized, uh, low power FM uh, newsletters that are circulated around. Um, you know, I'd even say the Illinois Times is an alternative media uh, because it is local, even though it's um, uh, only you know, a weekly. Uh, it still gets out to a lot of people and provides a different view of things. We're going to define alternative media more. But I wanted to go through just two in particular, two mega corporate conglomerate media out of the so-called Big Five. Time Warner is one of them. It used to be AOL Time Warner, but they just decided to drop AOL. Just to give you an idea of what they have. 2003 numbers, $41 billion in revenue. They own the WB television network, and that's a broadcast. They own on cable, Cinemax, CNN, Comedy Central, Court TV, HBO, Time Warner Cable, Turner Broadcasting System, for the internet, they have American Online, MapQuest, Movie Phone, Netscape, and the film industry. They have Castle Rock Entertainment, New Line Cinema, Warner Brothers Pictures, and Music. They have Atlantic Records, Electra Records, Warner Brothers Records, and even in publishing, they've got Little Brown and Company, Time, People, Sports Illustrated, and Fortune. That's all Time Warner. Somebody who thinks they have um, a good smattering of media that they're getting from independent sources might not realize 
that they are ingesting and using all of Time Warner's products without knowing it, without knowing that it's streamlined through one company. Another one, Viacom. That's a huge one. CBS. They've got uh, 180 radio stations. They've got um, BET, CMT, MTV, Nickelodeon, the Sundance Channel. They're also in film. They're also in the uh, music industry. They also own Blockbuster Video. So those are just two different mega corporate media that, um, that we can have examples of. Now, I do have an interesting story. Uh, some of the other ones, News Corp, that's one. Rupert Murdoch's whole deal, Fox News is under that one. You've got Universal, another huge conglomerate. Uh, Disney is a fascinating one. Disney owns so many different forms of media, from publishing to um, record labels to, to uh, uh, film studios. Uh, and they also own ABC News. And uh, I just received, I, when Mitt Romney was in town, I had to cover it for the radio station. So I had some sound bites of various people that were there, and one of the guys back at the station said, hey, you've got some sound bites of Mitt Romney, you know, Joe Schmo on the, on the scene. Uh, you might, might want to see if ABC News wants those. So I went ahead and contacted ABC News, and they told me how to upload it, and I sent it in, and it went up on their website to where other affiliates could then download that particular soundbite and put it into their story. Well, I got paid for that, and I just got the check. This is from ABC News, okay? Um, the check's only for $25, but it's got Mickey Mouse on it. <laughs> All right? So ABC News, this check came with Mickey Mouse on it. All right, it says... Disney Worldwide Services, paying agent for American Broadcasting Company. This floored me when I got it. I'm like, ABC News is a Mickey Mouse news organization. I mean, really, when you think about it. And that's the way it is with all the major broadcasts. Uh, with, with ABC, CBS, um, they're, they're all under various umbrellas that have strong corporate interests in getting you to think a certain way so you can buy into their culture and buy into their products. Another important thing uh, dealing with Disney is that uh, I think it was 1997 that they rewrote the copyright law to add like another 20 years to copyrights. And the reason that they did was... Say again? The Millennium Copyright, the Millennium Copyright Act? Yeah. They helped form that? Well, like they lobbied for it? But, but the issue was that, was that uh, Mickey Mouse was, you know, a couple years away from the public domain. Mm. And they weren't going to have that. Oh, no. No way. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, and uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, someone shared with me that her image is copyrighted and you can't like reprint it or something like that. It's, it's the copyright rules are fascinating and just to see how certain organizations will um, lobby to keep the status quo or to change things in their favor. And this, is all, this all plays into public opinion, okay? Because they can't do something without getting the public on board, at least a certain segment of the public on board. So to change the copyright laws, they have to say internet piracy is going to cause a global collapse of unbelievable proportions, so we need to push, uh, you know, stop online piracy act. I, that's priming, that's framing, that's agenda setting. Who had the problem? Was it was some kid at a school being violently beat up by somebody in New York downloading a Metallica album? Or was it the company that was being damaged by not selling Metallica albums? So they then went to the legislators and said, we need to do something about this. So you know, the question of how the policy comes about, why was there an issue, uh, whose interests are being uh, supported by uh, various actions or or even sympathies. But five conglomerates control most primetime TV programming, and one company, Clear Channel, dominates radio. Yet in the paradox of today's media landscape, consumers have more choices than ever, although critics say too many choices are low-brow offerings like reality TV. 
Meanwhile, you got newcomers like satellite radio, web blogging, all kinds of different internet websites that provide you streaming video, streaming audio, um, reports about the most ridiculous things you could ever imagine. One particular me media uh, giant, Viacom, their empire includes Simon & Schuster, MTV, uh, and stakes in so many different types of media, television, radio, newspapers, books, internet, theme parks. Theme parks. These, all these theme parks, Six Flags, Disney World, you've got, uh, oh, there's one um, down in Florida on the other side of the coast from Disney World, this real big. Universal Studios? Yeah, I mean, all of their, they're under the umbrella of these mega corporations. So, I mean, you don't think about that, but it's just another avenue where they can uh, you know, sell a certain product and a, a certain belief um, that, you know, anything is possible. You go to Disney World and you can hang out with Cinderella and watch um, Tinkerbell float around. Uh, so... You probably shouldn't upload that on YouTube. What's that? But you probably shouldn't upload that on YouTube. You should? Shouldn't. Shouldn't. Because Viacom went after YouTube. The Daily Show you don't own that part that. of your culture. Right. You do. Right. Yeah, so for you to even attempt to share it without their consent, you're violating... You probably shouldn't scan that check either. I want to. I, I'm, I don't even know if I'm going to cash it. I think I just wanna, I'm just going to keep it. Um, I don't know if I'm more disturbed that Mickey Mouse is on my check or that ABC News now has my social security number. I don't know which is scarier. Um, <clears throat> so... There's a lot of go, a lot of a lot happening with the study of mainstream media, and in particular, the study of mainstream media is more, uh, like I mentioned, a Marxist type of uh, critique. Uh, it's so hard to keep track of it, but that's where a lot of the mainstream media uh, research is focusing is just purely on ownership. Now let's get to the alternative media. Uh, the term alternative media defines uh, a media that that provides an outlet for disenfranchised groups. That, that's ultimately what it boils down to me, but it defies easy definition. The alternative can describe the content that media provides, the channel through which the content is provided, the source featured in the content, or the modes and values they espouse. So let's go over that again. The, the content the media provides, and that's the devotion of oppositional issues. For instance, <coughs> You know, transgender <coughs> issues, or uh, you've got the indigenous rights movements, and is the mainstream media going to provide an avenue for them to express themselves? More than likely not. Um, but the alternative media will. The alternative media will bolster their cause. They will facilitate getting their cause out to where it can be digested by a, a good amount of people. Wow, I'm going a lot longer than I thought I was. <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Okay. A uh, bunch of different factors to classify um, alternative media. And as I mentioned, uh, it's not just the content, it's not just the channel, it's also about the values. Citizen participation, direct action, collective decision making, etc. Collective decision making, that sounds like, you know, you're the Occupy General Assemblies. You know, uh, and, and the reason why Occupy fits so well into this evaluation of the mainstream media and the alternative media is uh, that it's obvious the, the alternative media uh, is the only media that will give protest movements a fair shake while you can very easily determine and define ways that the, alternative, or that the mainstream media is manipulating public opinion about a protest movement. So you can see varying degrees um, with even just local radio. We're going to talk about one media in particular, one form of media, not newspaper. We're going to talk about local radio just for a moment. Local talk radio does offer an avenue for people to take part in the creation of the media, which is one aspect of alternative media uh, that, that people have been able to define. Is alternative media, uh, the, the users help create the media. All right? So with local talk radio, you can call in and take part in it. Working with a local talk radio station, I see this happen every day. Now, some hosts might be more favorable to allow a certain person to continue to talk. Other hosts, not so much. They might 
turn off the phone, they might hit the dump button, but at least that, that channel is still there um, for various stations. Now we're going to, radio in general, you've got WMAY, which I work for, I am biased towards. Um, we have 10 hours of live local talk throughout the day. WTAX, another commercial radio station, only has a handful of hours that it's live and local. And I'm not even sure that there are many chances to call in and take part in the creation of the media. With WMAY, it's almost completely all driven by listeners calling in. And if the listeners don't call in, then the host just goes off and rambles, and that's what I feel like Saturday nights. Um, so the alternative media um, provides that avenue for the participants to help create the media. So you can see uh, varying degrees with just one form of media, and that's radio. Now, one uh, communication scholar, Downing, says that there are many kinds of alternative media just in this category, notably media of migrant workers, political refugees, as well as media of social minority, ethnic, and indigenous groups, women's movements media, the uh, uh, gay and lesbian media, labor media, reactionary and fascist media, local issue media. Uh, there's just so many types of alternative forms of media out there uh, that it's hard to, again, with, like with framing, it's hard to define, it's hard to nail down all the various forms of alternative media there are, as opposed to the mainstream media. It's pretty easy to determine what's a mainstream media. It's got a Disney logo on it, it's more than likely uh, that, no, it is, or else they get sued. It's, it's the mainstream media. Another communication scholar um, says, uh, some suggest the alternative producers, and this is something I, I, I take issue with, and I'll tell you why. Um, the producers may either have a non-commercial or non-profit orientation, or simply choose to designate themselves alternative. A lot of uh, definitions of alternative media do focus on that non-commercial and, and non-profit form of media. And I understand why, because in a way, if you're out there making a profit, then you know you might have uh, questions about your um, your motives. They might be they might be questioned. But in in media, uh, you need capital. Period. You cannot reach an audience without capital. You need some kind of uh, fund to. Uh, operate the, ta the radio towers, you need some kind of fund to buy the cameras and the switching equipment uh, to, to help pay for talent time. Uh, all these things that the mainstream media does with ease, building that capital to better uh, create their product, uh, the alternative media struggles with because there is that, that, that way of thinking that uh, there cannot be a profit structure there. There cannot be uh, any kind of uh, uh, capital being built up. Uh, and I think that really damages the, the reach of a lot of alternative media. What, yes? You, you mean that they have an ideological bent to be this way? Yes. A lot of alternative media has that. Mm -hmm. Some don't. All right? yeah. For instance, Alex Jones, PrisonPlanet.com or whatever. He's been doing his show for 17 years, he's been asked by Fox News to sign on. He said he gave him the big finger. He doesn't want any gatekeepers telling him what's going on. He wants to provide a certain uh, frame of the world uh, that he, as he sees it. Um, and in a way, he's also bolstering and facilitating a disenfranchised group uh, that doesn't have a voice in the mainstream media. So essentially, that makes Alex Jones part of the alternative media. You've also got, like I mentioned before, Democracy Now!, which bolsters and helps uh, facilitate the um, anti-war movement, the labor movement, the indigenous rights movement, uh, the gay and lesbian movement. So Democracy Now!, in a way, also is um, a, a prime example of, of, of an alternative media. But they both have advertisers? Democracy Now! does not. not. They are listener-supported. Now. Alex Jones has advertisers. He's syndicated. He gets money from syndicators uh, to do what he does. But he's not part of like a clear channel. Right. So, I mean, there's a huge difference. Like, for instance, the radio station I work at. I, in a way, because it's so local and because listeners can help create the media, 
by simply calling in. I consider WMAY as an alternative media because it's outside of the clear channel of the huge Time Warner. Uh, it is owned by a, a corporation that has 27 stations around the Midwest, but in no way is it even close to being considered uh, under the same power structure that Clear Channel is, with tens of thousands of radio stations. So, um, it, there's just so many varying degrees of alternative media uh, versus what the mainstream media is, which is pretty clear. So that funding source, I've always felt that I needed to get away from commercials. Um, you know, we even, as kids, would get the VCR set up to record the show so you could fast forward through the commercials. Now we got, you know, uh, digital video recorders and subscription services that help us skip the commercials. But those commercials are, are really important, uh, as I mentioned, because it helps build capital uh, for that particular media organization. Um, so think about that whenever evaluating what the media source you're getting is. Not all non-commercial media, um, or actually not all commercial media is, is, is mainstream media. Some of it may be alternative media, depending on the, the views that it promotes. Um, you've got the new media now, which you've got Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all of these different forms of new media. So we've talked about mainstream media, We've talked about the alternative media. Now we've got the new media. And this stuff is fresh off the book, you know, fresh off the printing press. There's not enough research yet to define uh, the impacts of social media. And with the recent uh, uh, Arab Spring and how Twitter was involved and how Facebook and all of these social networking uh, websites were involved in that particular movement, there's still a uh, it, it's, it's too fresh. There's not enough scholarly research into it. And people are salivating at, at getting at it. And maybe with future research, I will look into uh, the alternative media, but that's a lot of data mining. Um, I remember uh, the a local high school had uh, an issue where a kid used Twitter to make fun of people back and forth, uh, and then it, it boiled over to the point where some kid put on his Facebook page that uh, uh, it said South, uh, Southeast High or something that equals uh, Virginia Tech. And then the school had like a code red lockdown the next day because if somebody saw it online. And then, you know, I, when I heard about the story, I did some data mining, as, as it were, and searched all of these different tags and names. So, Essentially, what I'm trying to get at is it's too complex at this moment uh, to, for one person to be able to grab all of the, uh, the, the new media that there is and how it interacts with each other, how it interacts with protest movements. Uh, it's just it's too, it's too convoluted. There's too much there, uh, way too much data. So new media uh, is something that's, uh, that's just now becoming uh, aware in, in media research, especially when framing's involved, especially when agenda setting's involved, and the, uh, the coordination with um, protest movements uh, and uh, media. Now, I've got a bunch of Habermas quotes, which um, I'll essentially paraphrase. He talks about public opinion uh, and the promotion of certain ideas within the public sphere uh, and the commercialization of that. As I mentioned before, uh, it, can get, uh, it, can, it can dilute the message and make it go one way. Uh, in, in preference to a particular organization. So with all of this, um, as I mentioned, my, my study is going to use framing the definitions of the various media uh, to break down the first month's worth of Occupy. <coughs> my goal in all of this is to better define and uh, be able to share with others an understanding of how these media work against each other, work with each other, uh, facilitate a protest movement, or try to stifle a protest movement. The better we understand that, the less susceptible we will be to it, uh, which I think is pretty important to, to consider, because we all use media a certain way. Um, and we all also flock to a certain media that we know plays particular frames on our schemes. And we seek those out even 
subconsciously uh, because we know that that particular media outlet will tell me that story in the way that I'm familiar with, that I can have a common context with. So hopefully if you, if you know better the framing methods and, and understand the purpose of framing, then maybe you'll reevaluate your media intake and consider turning off the TV, um, which is quite exhilarating. Now, the upcoming protest movements, I wanted to talk about this briefly and then I open it up for discussion. The NATO summit in Chicago, uh, May 21st, uh, May 20th and the 21st, this is going to be unreal. Uh, everybody should keep their eye closely on, I mean, if you're into this type of thing, into this type of research, uh, just keep an eye on Twitter, on Facebook, see, you know, what the various protest movements you might be already um, uh, close to, see what their actions are, see what their posts are, watch Fox News, not, you know, necessarily saying you need to subscribe to it, but, you know, flip on and see if they're talking about um, the, the, the NATO summit and the protesters, how they're talking about the protesters, are they uh, uh, only talking about it when there's violent clashes with the police, uh, are they only talking about it when, uh, you know, providing what the outcome of NATO is. You know, the alternative media is going to provide the voice for the movement. Meanwhile, the mainstream media is going to provide the voice for the officials coming out of NATO, and they're going to disparage the protest movement. I mean, that's just the way the relationship is, um, because the mainstream media has certain interests. They're under that umbrella. They're the Mickey Mouse News Organization. They're the Time Warner CNNs. So um, these things going forward, I think it's important that we better understand how the media can frame things. And just in, in, the, few, in the, the past few months before the NATO summit, you've seen stories about um, Rahm Emanuel wanting to change ordinances to make it harder to parade, to increase the fines for resisting arrest. Uh, they had a lot of problems trying to get a parade route secured. Uh, there were even demonstrators who said they wanted the city to back them up in case the feds set up some security perimeter that outlawed peaceful assembly, and the city refused that. So you're getting all these stories, but the media is only going to, like I said before, they're going to put out some of the more prominent things in their lead and you need to go deeper to understand the true implications. And alternative media is going to give you those true implications right up front. So what it means that uh, the, the fines for resisting arrest are up. You know, the mainstream media is going to say to you right up front, oh, this means a lot of people are going to be intimidated and they're not going to come out. Meanwhile, the mainstream media is just simply going to say, it's going to cost more to resist arrest in the city of Chicago. So. Um, Keep that in mind when we move forward with the, uh, the NATO summits. With that, um, it's just some questions to think about. Uh, you, you've got the, the NATO summit coming up, and you've got the clashes of protesters versus police carrying sound cannons and masks. But who, who's going to facilitate who? We talked a little bit about the mainstream media and the alternative media, and... Um, the question that I have is, does the alternative media preach to the choir? And does it have the ability to reach out even more and, and not have a limited audience? And how do they go about doing that? You know, if an anti-war blogger gets arrested for protesting military action, does anybody notice? It's like police with violence. And so it's the protesters' fault that they're right. violence. And the way it's framed. All right, and then you might find another story. And, and imagine what uh, an alternative press would have done back then, what an alternative media would have done back then. They would have said police opened up with a barrage of, you know, batons, cracking kids on the head. Uh, you know, they would have framed it a certain way to make the police the villain. But I don't know if mainstream, uh, if alternative media was as prevalent back in the 60s. You know, like I said, I think... Uh, It'd be a great exercise to go back and evaluate some of these older protest movements, even back to you know, the Underground Railroad, and to d do an archival search for political cartoons, for uh, you know, whatever other... Or going back even farther, the, uh, was it the Committees of Correspondence? Mm. Like, just the, during the American Revolution? Sure. 
Yeah, all the handbills and all the, because all that stuff's considered alternative media. You know, the locally created uh, uh, editorials and, and the things about, you know, the revolution, spreading that message around. So, yeah, it, it's pretty fascinating to, uh, to play that, that, that exercise, but to actually do that study would take a lot of time, a lot of resources. Yes? How does um, your framing theory coincide with Chomsky's manufacturing consent? Oh, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities there. I'm not 100% uh, percent familiar with Chomsky's um, uh, method of getting consent, but I would assume that uh, it, w it would be along the lines of framing, uh, at least being able to put things in a certain context to get a desired outcome. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Uh, and framing's not just for communication. Right. Framing's also for organizational um, communication. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you came in a little late, but even interpersonal communication. You know, when we're telling a story to each other, we're going to frame that story in a certain way so that I know you better understand it, rather than me just giving you the raw data. Um, you won't be able to necessarily get all of that uh, uh, or understand all of that raw data unless I put it in proper context. Yes, yes. Uh, um, well, and then another thing with Occupy, eh, give or take one out of a dozen, one out of 20 people is holding up a camera. And there's, there's nothing we can do with mainstream media. At the four-day Midwest Regional Conference, there were 20 cities that came down, converged, mm -hmm. uh, to St. Louis, and uh, there were two images, a smashed um, police windshield that nobody ever saw. There's a lot of provocateurs mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And then some bored kids, after the conference was over and everybody went home, uh, graffitied the park. Those were the only two images that St. Louis saw in the mainstream media. We can never ever um, uh, compete with that. There, were, there will always be those images, even if it takes a provoc provocateur. Right, and to one row the you know so. But we've got one out of every dozen one out of every 20 people filming, okay. it may be preaching to the choir, sure. the whole world is watching, but that's pretty much all we can do. Yeah. But it's out there now, one time it was, like you talk about the uh, 60s, we said that. Have this. Yeah. And if you didn't read it or see it on TV, it didn't happen. Yeah. But yeah. that is, you can talk about the new media. Yeah. That's changing. Yeah. Because everything's documented. But even then, keep in mind, uh, and one of the things that uh, I think the new media has a problem with is the information is so readily available. When I, I mentioned I was watching, um, well, I was watching the, the Occupy movement September 17th, watching it online, doing the Twitter search for Occupy and finding all these tweets, and I saw one tweet over and over again. It said 65,000 people converge on downtown Manhattan, but... The, the mainstream media reports I saw only said a couple of thousand. So it's like one person put out a Twitter message that had Occupy in it, and it said 65,000 people are in downtown Manhattan occupying right now. This was in the first couple of days. That same message populated all over the place and spread like wildfire. I saw it retweeted at least you know, 15, 20, 30 times within a short period of time. That was misinformation in a way. It was not... Uh, accurate information. So I think that's one problem that the new media is going to have to, I don't know, I'm, I'm not saying regulate, because I'm not a big guy uh, as far as regulations are concerned, um, but it's something the new media is going to have to deal with. But you just have to stop and think. Some of the stuff could be exact. I mean, it's just common sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the same thing with the <laughs> mainstream media. I mean, they tell lies all the damn oh, time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's not like... It just somebody that's got their own little side on the uh, internet is going to do this kind of stuff. Right. No, and the mainstream media will distort. Yeah. Uh, and, and like so they, they actually, they, they tell lies. I mean, like, uh, you, uh, well, I'm sure you've done research about things like that. Mm -hmm. They'll talk and little things like oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. 
false flag operations yes. where 20, 30 years later you find out it was complete yeah. right. Yeah. right. Um, has there been any, especially, I mean, especially with the emergence of new media and, you know, now Facebook and Twitter exploding beyond, I mean, anything I think people really expected uh, them being able to do as far as reach, has there been any blurring of the lines or more the mainstream media kind of trying to delve into that, you know, like, as opposed to, now Viacom wants to buy this, that, and the other. Well, it was News know, Corp bought MySpace, media. yeah, mm -hmm. and then MySpace <laughs> fell apart, you know, yeah. I mean, I remember MySpace when that was, oh my god, you know, I was in a band when MySpace was big, and that was how you got gigs. That was how you reached out to people. That's how you got the music to the people, was MySpace. Yeah. But then News Corp owns Fox News. They bought it. And whatever they did with it. I don't, know if, I don't know if MySpace fell apart because users were freaked out that Fox News had access to it. Or well, if it was... Or, or, you know, but even then, I mean, Facebook wasn't uh, accessible to me at that time because I wasn't in school. So I didn't have a, 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 a university email. So even then, there was a certain amount of time that Facebook was off limits to people. But when they opened that up to everybody, that's when it blew up. And that's kind of along the same time that uh, MySpace fizzled out. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with their product got junky. And um, you know, people were able to change their MySpace page to all kinds of GIFs and Flash and just took 15 minutes to load a MySpace page sometimes. So um, Another thing that, I, that popped into my head when we were kind of talking about the blurred line that can be there between, you know, is it mainstream or is it independent was uh, Al Jazeera. Because they're very clearly a corporate, you know, media entity. They're global. They have offices everywhere. But because they're not based here out of America, they aren't looking at the world through the Western worldview. Yeah. And so it, you know, their message and who they're supporting is generally aligned with the alternative media. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Russia structured. Today. Russia Today is yeah. another one of those here in America, we would consider it an alternative media because, hell, that's, they're talking about Ron Paul. They're talking about Occupy. They're covering, uh, you know, the disenfranchised groups more than ABC is. Russia Today, which is an arm of the Russian government, just so people know that, all right? It is a propaganda arm of the Russian government, but they do a better job reporting on alternative uh, lifestyles on the disenfranchised groups than ABC does. There you go. There's I, your thesis. <laughs> oh, yeah, Mike. No, no. Good. Uh, well, she, well, the thing about uh, individuals, like, you know, if someone, you know, smashed a police car window, you know, that weekend, you know, so, uh, an or, you know, you can't even call Occupy an organization. Sure. Like, the, the, there can't be something that's grassroots like that. There can't be any accountability for people who just, you know, happen to be outside, you know, while this is going on. And so, you know, you can't really blame, you know, a movement. I understand for, that, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, you can't group all these people together. But the mainstream media does and will and they'll do it effectively. But but if we could, you know, sort of make people realize that in, you know, an organization, I mean, it, it's not even an organization. It's just a bunch of people it's who people's movement who happen to be in the same place at the same time. Sure. They can't, you know, police everyone, and you can't, and so there's no accountability. And if there's no accountability, there can't be any blame placed on. But it's the prop. It's the propaganda. When you watch the film coverage uh, for NATO in May, mm -hmm. you are going to see whatever little rabble rousing, and it may be one percent of the one hundred percent. That's what you will see. They'll here. pick out. Guaranteed. They'll pick out the most colorful person who's ranting about the most ridiculous. Point, yeah, you and won't, you that's will what they'll focus see on. the 99% of the other. Mm -hmm. The weed sign in our uh, <laughs> Occupier State Capitol. Yeah. The guy had a five foot. Who was that? Uh, I, think I know that guy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because he also shows up to other. He's got this other he great sign. It was the picture in the paper. Oh, yeah, it was right because there in front. That's fine. That's, 
you know, I'll burn a flag at your event. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, right. Uh, and incite a certain it's, reaction. I got to control TV off. Yeah. Uh, that same guy also, uh, he had this one sign at another rally. Uh, it said, it's just like a 10 by 10 sign. It said two words, buy guns. That's <laughs> all it said. And he walked down the street. I was like, that's... that's <laughs> It's just so in your face. It's great, um, but yeah, that that, that 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 type of thing happens. And I'm he the, knows <clears throat> he does that because he knows that's what. Well, know. I don't think I, I know this individual personally. I don't think he's a provocateur. I don't think. Yo, know, I yeah, I talk. But to there him. are provocateurs. But I think it's part of the process. He knows that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah, that's going to be so prominent. That's why he made it so big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what it said on there? I uh, don't remember what it said. Buy like, weed, but, not jails. Yeah, or, I couldn't disagree with the point. Yeah, I was like, man, you're gonna get the paper, and they're gonna ignore right. all the relevant right. stuff. Um, but yeah, provocateurs are real. And I remember one clip I saw. It was uh, published on YouTube, September 19th, so two days after the Occupy thing. Uh, and it was Truth Squad TV. It's it. I just checked the video again, and it only had like 1,900 views. Okay, so. Barely anybody watched this this particular six minute news package that some guy did, uh, and it was a fantastic news package because he talked about the the movement that was there. He interviewed a huge cross section of the people, saying that, "Oh, I'm a I'm an anarcho capitalist. Oh, I'm a libertarian. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a conservative. I'm here. I'm upset about the banker bailouts. Well, oh, I'm a socialist." This person went out and grabbed a huge section of the Occupy population that was there and presented that. Then he also went and said something you're never going to hear ABC News report. He said, uh, and the provocateurs, the undercover police officers, are very easy to spot. And he showed video of them. Guys wearing S-kicking boots, black pants, cargo pants, they're standing all weird, uncomfortable, looking like black block right? anarchists getting ready to go bash in a Starbucks window. But they're just standing there looking uncomfortable, and he pointed out, he said, these are obviously undercover police officers uh, either here to take pictures of the people here or to help incite some kind, of, um, some kind of action that would allow the police to act, and then the media is going to report the story that 700 people are arrested uh, on the bridge. And one thing I've uh, been able to d determine is the mainstream media will not report on a protest movement for a couple of reasons. If there's not a solid point or a solid target for the protest, if there's not a particular grievance that, um, that the protest movement is focused on, like for instance LBJ or Nixon during the war, there's not a, 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 a person that it's directed to. The mainstream media is going to have a difficult time <coughs> trying to pick up on the story. And I think that's one thing of the Occupy movement and one of the lessons I hope to draw out of the, uh, the, the research one of the lessons to learn about the Occupy movement is, should there be a solid message? Should there be, you know, a couple of core things? And there was a lot of criticism within that first month. You know, it was so scattershot. There wasn't, it wasn't an organization. It was just a collective of people in the same place at the same time, upset about a whole bunch of different things. So the media had a hard time even trying to crystallize what was going on there. Um, so that's just one, one thing that uh, I think uh, determines a lot of the, the mainstream media coverage as well. Uh, that and the size of the protests. So you're saying basically that that's a problem for the media, it's not a problem for the public, not a problem for the organization, right? Well, I think, I think it's a problem with the, the organization, with, with the movement, because if they don't have um, a solid message to put out there, then it's going to be difficult for them to break out of the alternative media and to get that much larger audience, because keep in mind, there is only a small minority of people who are actually active. And by active, I mean going door to door, lobbying their lawmakers, protesting, taking to the streets, holding signs on street corners, handing out handbills. There's only a small fraction of those people. The rest of them, either they are part of a political organization and they go there for social hour, they are, uh, watch CNN and they feel like they're politically involved, or they're just completely checked out of the system entirely. Yeah. Um, so, for a protest movement to even think about reaching that much larger group of people who are not active, not aware, it might be gut check time to say, we, we need to somehow get through that barrier. And the alternative media can assist in that to a degree, but then again, you're asking the question, are you preaching to the choir? 
mentioned that the video you saw that only had like 1,600 hits. Yeah. The guy does a good job of covering people. I, I've read this before that this is a much more eclectic group than is presented by the mass media. Mm -hmm. And if we start to do with the media and what we what you know answer that criticism of no main grievances, every bullet point we put on our agenda mm -hmm. leads to one group or another that can no longer stand with the plurality. Sure. Because, yeah. you know, and they don't want one bullet point. Mm -hmm. They want a lined out agenda like the Democrats and the Republicans right. have developed a over a hundred years. Right, right. Yeah, they want a platform on every issue, and they don't want it to be gray. They want mm -hmm. it to fit into the black and white picture of the world that the mainstream media paints. Mm -hmm. You know, and so... And I in that black it, and white world, they also, with the Occupy movement, they regularly compared it to the Tea Party movement. Yep. It's like, wait, where's that comparison? How's that even a comparison? We're protesting. <laughs> right, and, and that's, that's just simply what the mainstream... Because that was the only way they could provide a certain context to their audience. You know, and the... The issue of grievances will all is going to be something the movement will always struggle with, sure. you know. But you know, and then, like you said, there's the hard critique of it, mm -hmm. and then there are those with those who have stood with it and said that's the that's the core strength of the movement is mm -hmm. that you don't have. We want this and then this and then this and then this because when you lay out that list, one it divides you, and two it presents the atmosphere of when we get this, mm -hmm. we're done. We're done, right? Mm -hmm. Which you know. Could be a critique of you know if you look at uh, race relations in our country we started with slave direct slavery mm -hmm. we then abolished that and we had the Jim Crow laws and then the, we legally abolished that and now we have a system of mass incarceration and you know food deserts and isolated concentrated poverty mm -hmm. you know and but in the 60s we got Roe or we not Roe versus we got Brown versus Board of Education and they said 50s yeah the 50s and 54 you know and you're, yes. Mm -hmm. We got it, and you know. Then over the course of a decade and a half, they said, "Wow, we really did get it. We got the equal rights amendment. We got all this. People went home." Mm -hmm. And then decades later, we look at the state of our world, and we yeah. say race relations aren't fixed. You know, and so that's the other problem with the agenda is when you what happens when you get to the bottom of your list. You check everything off, and you're done for the day. You go on holiday. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the news goes, "You did it." Yeah. So when we say, "Well, that was just the first step," they go. No, no, we're not. We're not ready for this. Uh, the NFL is getting ready to start. Yeah. Yeah, we got a new season of American Idol. We yeah. can't. We can't be bothered with this. <laughs> we're trying to dictate culture here. Okay, leave us alone. So we should start singing. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, it was pretty fun when we sang Bohemian Rhapsody when we were oh, in wow. the middle of the street on the plaza. Nice. <laughs> you talk about the media covering Occupy, and one thing that comes to mind is that when you have an anti-war protest, you know, like. You, you, you can have an anchor saying, you know, our top story is, you know, an anti-war protest, but it's difficult to identify. I mean, I think people have heard the term Occupy and sort of know, you know, that it exists. But yeah, it's you, almost you become a household name. But you can't, like, very quickly say, you know, the, the economic injustice protests, because that's, because that's not even, like... Like, you, you're not done, you know, explaining what the protest is before you can even get onto the story of what happened. You know, it's not sound by other. Right, right. Yeah, that's the problem that the media has, too, is soundbite culture and life is not a soundbite. And the death of nuance? Yeah, oh yeah. For, for me, when I cover news, you know, I have to find that 20-second soundbite. If not, I, I'm told, you can't have anything more than 30 seconds. If you have anything more than 30 seconds, it draws on too long, you lose the audience's attention. So I have to find that 20-second soundbite to fit into the story. Oh, wait a minute. Like, you think the majority of people are that, that weak that they, they can't actually watch something for more than 20 seconds? I think the media thinks that. Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, the people I know are attentive. They'll stick with something for a long time. They'll read a book. Yeah. Um, but I, mean, I don't vary. My point is the average person is not that... Um, they don't. They have more than the attention span of a hummingbird. Sure, say. sure. Yeah, it's, it's not that. I agree. I agree. No, no, but the the popular culture. Not that weak. <laughs> say again. The average person is not that weak. No, I agree. I agree. You might also. That might also be like if you're flipping through channels, you know, and you come in in the middle of you know a 30 second thing, then you know it'll be over, and then you'll go right on to the next thing. But if you are in the middle of something that's like 30 minutes, 
then you miss half of it. And so they want things in small chunks so that people can uh, access them easier. It's like with radio too. You got the hour, but twenty of that hour, twenty minutes of that hour is commercials. If they put all those commercials in one twenty-minute block, who would listen to that? Yeah, you would. You would change the channel and find something else that had some content, and then you'd come back to your favorite channel after the twenty-minute commercial break. Instead, we break it up into five different breaks, three minutes each. That way, you're compelled to listen through the commercial break because you don't want to miss the next point that the host is making. So, you know, one more question. What time is it? Holy cow! I can't believe that. All right. Um, kind of going along the idea of how do we engage the mainstream media. You know, I understand why it's important for the Occupy movement to do so as far as, you know, getting their reach and stuff. But how do we deal with the ethical dilemma of them being so intrinsically tied into everything we're fighting? You know, you talked about, you know, your check from ABC has a Mickey Mouse logo on it. And, you know, if you dig deeper into that, not only that, but I bet, you know, a good, ex you know, a good chunk of the advertising you're seeing on each channel is from subsidiary companies. So not only are they using it to frame your, you know, how you think about the world, but then they're telling you what to buy at the same time, you know, and so they're, I understand how we, you know, why we need to try to engage them as far as access, but how do we deal with that um, morally as far as, you know, working, you know, with the people that we ultimately do want to bring down, yeah. you know, and would it be better to try to elevate our own media source to that, you know? Area? I think that's the ultimate goal is to get past these mega corporations that are supranational. They don't care about the United States. They don't care about Burma. You know, they don't care about whatever other country. They're they're beyond nations now. Right? And they have the financial resources to be able to continue that. <clears throat> and again, to that point of capital and media organizations, it's almost necessary to have it. If you don't have it, you have a f struggling outlet that is going to not be able to reach out to people. One thing, and, and I go to Alex Jones, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Alex Jones, um, simply because I've seen him grow exponentially in the past 10 years. Um, you know, he went from doing a public access TV show to getting syndicated uh, to where now he is essentially developing uh, an internet streaming channel where he does his radio show, it's also a TV show, then at night he does, you know, an hour-long news magazine type show. Um, and I, I, would, I would assume in the next couple of years, Alex Jones is going to be, you know, Prison Planet radio or whatever is going to be a huge force to reckon with, especially comparing it to, you know, the likes of a mainstream media outlet like CNN. You might be able to flip on the TV and see Alex Jones' alternative media talking about 9-11 truth, talking about, uh, you know, all kinds of globalization issues, things that, you know, framing it in a way that you're not going to get from the mainstream media. So, um, and he's doing that simply because he's got a business model that's allowing him to grow. Uh, through advertisements, but he also does listener contributions. You know, people subscribe to his service, very similar to how uh, people might donate money to Democracy Now! or PBS or yeah. wherever else. Yeah, so I, yeah, I know throughout the Occupy movement, really I'm sure in every cell there are people talking about creation of our own media systems. And, yeah. You know, like you said, you just had to type in Occupy Wall Street on Twitter and whether that was real information, right, you know, or false, that's up to you to then dig deeper. But, you know, um, I know a number of us have talked about, you know, the mainstream media is a stopgap until we get that off the ground, you know, and mm -hmm. we work with them because because they have access, mm -hmm. but because they are ultimately the opponent, we eventually shift to something sustainable within ourselves. And sometimes talking to the mainstream media backfires. Yep. You know? I've, Remember when the day after, the night after Oakland, um, we had a GA, and then after the GA, we just kind of walked around and uh, did an impromptu protest at you know nine o'clock at night, and it ended at the uh, uh, city municipal building at the police station, where some of our members went in and said we would like to 
have a nonviolence pledge between us and the city of Springfield. Would you be willing to sign that? You know, and they had a conversation with us, blah, blah, blah. But while we were sitting outside waiting for them to respond, Fox News Chicago was across the street at Zaputo's talking to politicians. And they came out, they did a, I mean, really a 10-minute interview with us, you know, talked about it, you know, tried to bring it to the front, tried to spin it on the primaries. We didn't, we weren't spinnable. We stayed on our points. We wouldn't talk, you know, we wouldn't go off on their tangents. Well, I mean, they didn't come. The they didn't the capital, it, let alone air it. Yeah, the Occupy the Capital thing, I was there, uh, it was pretty fascinating to watch. I believe that was the protest right before they uh, passed legislation to give the tax breaks to uh, CME and CME. Um, and that was when, you know, everybody kind of just started reading off the pamphlet. One person would read real loud, and then when that person got taken out for being too loud, somebody else would pick up where they left off. That was brilliant, number one. Number two... Mic check. Yeah, I mean, it was, well, but that, but not necessarily how, because typically, from what I understand, mic check is one person talks and then repeats, but this was like, somebody was taken down and the message still continued because you guys were on the same page, yeah. just continuing the, the message. Uh, that, that was brilliant, because it was still very loud in there, even though people, one after the other, was asked to leave. And, you know, I'm there with my media microphone and my media pass, and playing whatever role I can, and um, I remember watching the local TV affiliate come to one of the protesters who was kicked out and said, did you guys have a permit? You know, that's, that's the frame that they were going for. They weren't going for, why are you here? What's the, what's the point you're trying to get across to the lawmakers? The question that the local affiliate, some young, new, news, whatever, uh, on the ABC Channel 20 or whatever, she, her question was focused primarily on, did you have a permit? And so why didn't you have a constitution? So you have freedom of speech. Well, that was what uh, that was what several of the uh, yeah. the Occupy guys said. They said uh, se the First Amendment's my my uh, yeah. petition, my uh, permit. Those little rights, lady, here it is. Yeah. If you don't know what you're talking about, all right. I can read it to you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but they won't back, yeah. they won't exactly. back down. They're not going to reframe it. No, they won't. They won't. So I mean, those types of things you always have to be on the lookout for. And uh, if you reframe it, you're not getting any yeah. Right. No. Yeah, they'll just cut. So hopefully, you know, this conversation, and a lot of you probably already had these types of understandings, but hopefully having some different terminology and definitions to help back it up, you can better at least frame, frame, frame <laughs> and, help, uh, and help others understand just how manipulative media can be. Not that that's a bad thing or a good thing because... You also need to manipulate it for your own interests. But yeah, that's why we, you know, when we do something, we have to have our talking points ready, and we stay on point. Yep. You know, we stay on our things. When they want to take you something else, you just keep bringing them back. Bring I them back. Yeah. Nice. When we're talking, when we're doing the food drive, and they want to talk about, you know, new dish or whatever. <laughs> You know, that food drive was directed at him, you know, yeah. but, you know, when we're doing a food drive and they want to talk about CME, it's, no, right now we're doing this. And it's good stuff. I'm fascinated by media in general. And, well, uh, just seeing the underlying, you know, uh, how, it, how it works uh, and realizing that uh, it's magic in a way, you know, I mean, it's, it's hypnosis, it's psychology, uh, and it works. I think it's interesting to watch the difference in Channel 20 and, and uh, the TV station from Decatur. I mean, Decatur will ask more questions and, and let oh, you know. Right. And then they may cut the heck out of you when it gets back. But Channel 20 is on some stupid little she makes it out Disneyland thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're on her Mickey Mouse so shit. Sure. <laughs> they're going back and do the Mickey Mouse shit on TV. Yeah. yeah. No, they're not going to talk about it. It's fluff, it's there. banter back and forth, it's, uh, what do they call it, pap? It's, uh, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's worthless. I, I can't, I can't watch TV anymore. I can't, I just can't do it. I mean, if I even turn on the broadcast TV, I will start yelling at the TV. My girlfriend uh, hates it when I watch cable TV. Uh, and that's why I think, uh, at least my reasoning was to get rid of the cable was because when I would flip through CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, I'd be yelling at the TV. I wouldn't be watching it. I'd be yelling at it. Um, that's not what I'm ashamed about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, my phone, 
from the time I was a kid, he yelled at the TV. Yeah. And that's like 50 plus years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, so some people, they all express their opinion. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. But it's a. Uh, it's like yelling at a brick wall, you know. It's and you're the, the, the TV is not a channel. It's not a receptor. <laughs> so do a commercial. When are you on? Oh, I am on uh, Saturday evenings from um, three to seven p.m. Uh, that's when I have my uh, talk show, which is just me, unfiltered. Uh, nobody tells me what to talk about. That's one reason why I like WMAY so much. Is they they do have <laughs> uh, you've got the Kramers, who are. Shock jocks, um, who you know purposely go out there to push buttons and to provoke a certain reaction. Uh, it's theater, but then you know, for me, I I feel it's a different type of radio program because I do provide that um, that voice for disenfranchised groups. I talk about the stories you're not going to hear uh, in a certain context. That um, that even you know some of my coworkers won't even dare. Mentioned. So, Saturday nights from 3 to 7, uh, 4 hours. It's an open format talk show. Uh, but I also do um, news in the mornings from uh, 6 in the morning till, depends, could be noon, could be 1 o'clock. Uh, and there's this other fascinating thing I've been able to develop over the past year or so, and that's called the Council Roundup. If anybody uh, lives in Springfield and you're concerned about Springfield government, uh, in City Hall in particular, I would strongly encourage that you listen uh, to the Council Roundup Wednesday mornings. Uh, Ray Lytle is back on the air, if you guys aren't familiar who Ray Lytle is. He was a shock jock uh, back in the early 90s. He lasted until 2000 or something like that. Uh, well, he's back on the airwaves now. No longer is he on FM rock radio. Now he's doing a talk show, and we were able to get together and it clicked right, I covered city council, came back with all these clips, and now we're able to develop the characters from the city council. We're able to talk about the issues in a very long form instead of being small sound bites. And, you know, in a way, I, I, I think it's fantastic because it's only encouraging people to know what's going on within their government. Because even the newspaper is not going to tell you everything that happens in the city council. They'll tell you one or two major things, the most salacious or the most salient things that they think are most important. But then again, when you go back and you look at the council agenda and what passed, then you start, oh, why didn't they tell me about that? Why didn't they tell me that there's a huge water deal between you know, these two counties and now it's going to cost uh, so and so more? Yeah, it's just those types of things where they only provide you with a certain amount of information. With the council roundup, I try to put everything in there. If it's if it's got uh, a funny clip, or if it's got a serious clip, we're gonna play it. We're gonna we're gonna expose it. So, so you see some of your co-workers, uh, certain topics you were discussed they wouldn't. Yeah. That touch. Well, why would they? You all work for the same company. Why yeah. would they be inhibited? Why would? They, well, I think their own um, preference. It's their own personal preference. They don't want to. Yeah, they don't want to. They don't want to get into. Their own personal bias. Yeah. Um, okay. Like for instance, when I bring up fluoride. People look at me like I have five eyes. Yeah. But well, that's because of Stanley Kubrick. Well, yeah, and see, there, yeah, there's all kinds of different um, schemes that have been developed over the years. Uh, but you know, various other things I talk. Like years ago, I talked about the Illinois Eavesdropping Act, and I didn't hear my boss ever talk about it until recently, when the Illinois Eavesdropping Act became a big deal because it kept getting thrown out of courts. Or so is that you know, the thing where you can't videotape a police officer? Yeah. You can't videotape anybody. This right now, if, if I didn't give consent to this, I could charge whoever set this up with a felony. I could make a complaint and have the state prosecutor. Um, Technically, the video wasn't the problem. It was it's the, the audio, audio that the video pulled. Right. So if I could mute that camera, he couldn't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and that's only because of uh, B-roll. Like, you know, they... Uh, you, you can have like a video of you know just you know a crowd and and not need to get their consent because you're going to talk over it. Right, but then you can also get a video of your kid playing in the park and then pick up a couple's conversation just around the corner and not maliciously doing it, and they could under the law come back and charge you. Something else about the Illinois Eavesdropping Act: everybody's got a cell phone. 
that's a that's an eavesdropping device yeah. um, because you can record stuff on it. In the act, it says specifically anything that can be that can record surreptitiously. I could set my cell phone, hit record, put it in my pocket, go into a convenience store, and grab everybody's conversation. Um, so I, there's a lot of things about the eavesdropping act. But Chris, last question. Uh, I was just curious on your thoughts. I might sound like a one-trick pony, but this is always my curiosity with speakers. But are you familiar with Grand Sai's work on cultural hegemony? Mm -mm. Uh, who, who is it again? Gramsci. 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 Uh, basically, if you think of the oh, term, Gramsci. yeah. Sorry. If you think of the term "drinking the Kool-Aid," yeah, that's what they're referring to with okay. cultural hegemony. Yeah. So, in your mind, do you think? say the big mainstream media acts the way they do because they want to dish out that Kool-Aid or because they themselves are also drinking it? The presenters, um, the, the news readers, the anchors, the talking heads, the, the morning talk show hosts or whatever, uh, you know, the Fox and Friends, they're caught up in a culture. They, they know what they're, 90% they, of what they're saying is BS. Uh, they're saying it because they're getting a fat paycheck and they're living a uh, larger than life life. Um, as far as the content, they don't say anything that doesn't get approved. They have gatekeepers. That's another aspect of uh, communication um, uh, academics is is especially in news gatekeepers. I mean, it's not you know it sounds like a crazy conspiracy theory term, but no, that's that's the term. It's the people who, inside the boardrooms, make the decisions about what's going to be the news that day. How it's going to be framed, what the editorial is going to be, which political cartoon they're going to grab, um, what letters to the editor to include to provide a certain type of uh, frame for that whole entire news page, or, um, you know, the talking points that, uh, that they're going to release on... Uh, um, Rachel Maddow's show, or on Bill O'Reilly's show, or whatever other uh, you know, corporation uh, you can think of. So it, there, it's a combination of gatekeepers, and they are caught up in that culture. Um, something you're not going to see with alternative media. Um, well, everybody, thank you so much. I can't believe the time is, jeez, uh, two hours. That's, uh, that's amazing. I thought I was going to do 40 minutes, and that was it. But um, Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right, take this picture off. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs>